Hello, my name is May Cannon, and I'm the Executive Director of Churches for Middle East Peace. Thank you for joining us for this web webinar where we'll be talking about Yemen, the greatest humanitarian crisis of our time. And we have the great privilege of having the humanitarian policy lead from Oxfam America joining us, who's an expert on Yemen and conflicts around the world. So let's welcome Scott Paul, who's here with us this morning. Welcome, Scott. Thanks, May. It's great to be with you all today. So your resume is quite impressive. I see that you've been with Oxfam for seven years. Um, your tenure has included spearheading a lot of work on conflict resolution around the world, including Somalia, Nigeria, Myanmar, Bangladesh, and Yemen, that your expertise and um, wisdom and policy analysis is often sought out by members of Congress and the State Department. Um, and not only that, you are just recently back from February travels to Yemen. So one, welcome back, and two, just Thank what you. a privilege to have you with us. Thank you, it's great to be here. So tell us about um, Oxfam, just kind of broadly, but your work more specifically. would love to know a little bit more about your background before we jump into seeking to understand more about this particular conflict. Would love to. Oxfam is a, a justice organization. We fight the injustice of poverty worldwide. Um, in Yemen, we are delivering a humanitarian response together with Yemeni partner organizations that so far reached more than 3 million people, um, mostly with um, uh, access to fresh and safe, clean and safe water, um, sanitation services, um, hygiene. Um, we've also supported gender justice and we've helped distribute cash so that people can buy food in the markets to combat malnutrition. My, my own work um, is here mostly in Washington, D.C., where I advocate for policies that support the, the human rights of people in humanitarian emergencies. Well, um, and our work at Churches for Middle East Peace has focused historically primarily on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but we feel like we can't have integrity at CMEP and not pay attention to what's been identified by the United Nations as the greatest humanitarian crisis of our time. And part of what's so catastrophic in my limited understanding is the way that it's so man-made, but not only how... Um, we as humans have contributed to this, but particularly that the United States is culpable in exacerbating the humanitarian crisis in Yemen. Yeah. So um, just in terms of what this is gonna look like, we already have um, several people online who are listening live. We will record this for future reference, but we'll do kind of 20, 30 minutes of conversation and then open it up for questions so people can type their questions on the chat as we go to be a part of this conversation. But our hope was we really wanted to hear from an expert to help us understand, you know, CMAP is very much in alignment with your policies on this particular issue, but we wanna have a deeper understanding of the root of the cause of the crisis and also the history. So get us started, Scott, what do, what do we need to know? Thank you, and um, in that spirit, for all of you who are joining us who might feel a little bit intimidated about the complexity of a crisis that's in a country that's pretty far away um, and that doesn't have as much day-to-day -day exposure um, in the media or hasn't historically to most Americans. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for wanting to learn. Um, and my hope is that by the end of our time today, you will feel maybe not expert, but um, confident in your ability to create change because we in the US here have a huge amount of leverage to push this conflict toward a resolution and for relief of this crisis. So how did we get here, first of all? Um, I'll spare you the long uh, hi uh, history of Yemen lesson, which frankly, I'm not very qualified to give and just skip towards the more recent history. In 2011 and 2012, there was a revolution in Yemen um, against a decades old autocratic regime led by former president Ali Abdullah Saleh and people in Yemen demanded change, and they succeeded in pushing former President Saleh out of office. And what happened then is essentially there was a, a transitional initiative that was created, and in parallel, um, a, a national dialogue conference to take stock of the demands of different parts of civil society and to try to put together a functioning democratic state. The process, unfortunately, went off the rails. And there were a lot of people who were disappointed with how it went. 
Um, there were a lot of grievances against the government. One of the groups uh, that over the previous 10 or 15 years had been uh, really opposed um, and, and had experienced a lot of, of violence at the hands of the former Yemen, Yemeni government uh, was called the Houthis. The Houthis started as sort of like a religious and educational movement and ultimately became an armed group. And in a weird twist of fate, actually allied themselves to the former president um, to fight against the transitional government in Yemen. And they ultimately succeeded in pushing that transitional government led by the, the current president of Yemen, who, uh, whose name is Abdurrahman Mansur Hadi, out of Yemen. And when he was pushed into exile, um, he requested the assistance of Saudi Arabia and a number of other Arab countries. And those countries, supported by the United States, came to his aid and, and, and ultimately led um, um, a mostly air-driven military campaign to reinstall him and push back against the Houthis. Um, and there's, now, there's since then been nearly four years of conflict. The front lines have shifted a bit, but that's more or less, that's how the conflict falls today. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about um, President Hadi, I know he fled to Saudi Arabia at some point. He's back in Yemen now. He um, he's he's named the city of Aden, which was uh, which is a city in the south. When Yemen was split, it was the capital of South Yemen. Um, but he, so he's named Aden his temporary capital, although he spends most of his time in Saudi Arabia. Okay, and so when we talk about like coalition airstrikes and we talk about the coalition or the Saudi coalition, which we know the U.S. has, um, you know, refueled planes and been supportive of the coalition, that would be in alignment with President Hadi. That's right. That's exactly right. Okay, and just a little bit more history before we go on to the humanitarian effects of this conflict. I was quite intrigued um, that the launching point of this conflict was in November 2011, very much kind of in this, um, in light of the Arab Spring. How, how much of kind of the Arab Spring influences, you know, the, the dynamics of the Arab world in general, how much does that contribute to this dynamic? And the reason I'm asking specifically is, I hear often what's talked about in Yemen being a civil war, and is it really a civil war from your perspective, or is it really you know, a conflict that's much more regional? In a sense, it's both. Um, because what happened, yeah, I think what the events of 2011 and 2012 were very much in line with the regional trends at the time of the Arab Spring. There was a lot of hope and optimism amongst members of civil society, women and youth leaders, that tomorrow was going to be better than yesterday. Um, and so what emerged was a civil war that ultimately became exacerbated when the Saudi-led coalition, I should say Saudi and Emirati-led coalition, since the United Arab Emirates have now played a leading role in the, in the conflict also, became involved. And then they became one of the central parties in the conflict. And they, they saw the conflict um, or framed the conflict to other governments and the international community also as a battle against Iranian influence because the Houthis are seen to be aligned with Iran. Um, so in essence, I think the answer is, yeah, this is a civil war. It's mostly about what some Yemenis want versus what other Yemenis want. But the engagement of other regional and global powers have actually made it much more com uh, complicated and difficult to resolve. Um, and, and, and they have also escalated the conflict and, and given rise to the humanitarian crisis. Mm -hmm. That's um, very helpful. I actually lived in Jerusalem during the Arab Spring and was in a Tahrir Square in Egypt just a few weeks after oh, the wow. January 25th revolution. And, <laughs> you know, traveling in Alexandria during that time, when you talk about a time of great hope, I mean, you know, people would have the cross and the crescent and all this paint and everything was, I mean, this was Egypt, but... Yeah. Just it was such a time of aspirations that the future could be different, and here we are, you know, years later, um, and the reality is a very different reality from that hopeful scene. Yeah. So, you've talked to us some about this political background, and then we've said this is the greatest humanitarian crisis of our time. What's the relationship? Um, what's what are the political causes, yeah. and why do we say this is a man-made crisis? Yeah, the relationship is direct. As you say, this is entirely driven by human behavior. 
there have been natural hazards at the margins over the past four years, but nothing out of the norm. Um, nothing to explain what is what is by far the largest humanitarian crisis of our time. Um, it's not simple. And so what I've tried to do is I've tried to give people a shorthand. So there are four I words um, that I, I think can help explain the crisis. And if you remember the four I words, you'll probably be able to sort of like at least remember and retain and maybe explain to other people why the crisis has, has grown so exponentially. So the four I's. The first of these I words is inequality. Um, Yemen has for a long time been a country that has featured a huge amount of social and economic hierarchy. Um, there are a handful of people who are extraordinarily wealthy in Yemen and they're doing mostly just fine. Um, there's an, a, a sort of second tier of, of middle and upper class people in Yemen who have substantial amounts of money um, who are going to be able to ride it out. But they're, they're sort of hurting a little bit. They're, hurt, they're hurting a lot, but I think they're able to survive and their, their livelihoods and survival aren't threatened. And then there's everybody else. And within the everybody else, there's actually about 15% of Yemenis who are socially segregated. Um, who, are, who are sort of the lowest rung of a very rigid caste system and only able to do certain jobs. Um, and they're, they're struggling the most. Um, and so inequality is really the fault line of the crisis. If you're, if, if you're wealthy and powerful, you're probably okay. You can buy any number of the abun abundant goods in the markets. Um, but if you're poor, you're struggling. So inequality. What percentage, uh, when you say 15%, I mean, how many people are we talking about? Well, Yemen's a country of about 29 million people. Um, to break that down, um, about 24 million people need some kind of humanitarian assistance to live in dignity. About 20 million people um, don't have enough to eat. Of those, about 15 million people don't know where they're going to find their next meal. Um, and about 5 million people um, are one step away from famine right now. Okay. Um, and there's there are um, events that could play out that could put a much bigger number. Um, we put it at about 12 to 14 million people who could throw that group into famine in a very short amount of time if the conflict escalates. Okay. So that's how it breaks down. And it's mostly on that fault line of inequality. Mm -hmm. So three more I words to go. The second is uh, infrastructure. Um, Yemen's civilian and economic infrastructure has been decimated by the war. Um, and so, and a lot of that, not all of that, but a lot of that is at the hands of Saudi and Emirati led coalition airstrikes that the United States has supported. Um, so what kind of infrastructure are we talking about? Um, schools, hospitals, water treatment plants, roads, bridges, ports, markets, the things that people need to survive on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so without those, it's become really, really, really difficult for people to eke out a living and eke out, a, and eke out survival. So that's, that's infrastructure. Third is imports. Since the beginning of the conflict, um, Saudi Arabia has imposed what we've called a de facto blockade on most of Yemen. Now at times, that has that's looked at diff that's looked different ways at different times. At times, that's been um, no goods are allowed into the country. At times, that's just we're going to delay every ship coming in to a certain port for anywhere from three weeks to two months. But those delays cost the shippers so much money that by the time the goods get to market, prices are exponential. Um, and so, um, for a family struggling to find work. They're not going to be able to afford those goods. And Yemen, it's important to bear in mind, is one of the most import-dependent countries in the world, in particular for its food and its refined fuel and some of its more um, sophisticated medical equipment and supplies. So I have a statistic in front of me that says before the war that 90% of food was imported to Yemen. Yeah, huge amount. Okay. Right. So that's imports. Um, the last I is um, institutions. And here we're talking about, we, we talked a bit about the damage to infrastructure and that's collapsed private sector institutions, private companies as job creators and sources of income. Um, but we're also talking about the government. In the north of Yemen, uh, areas controlled by the Houthis, 
Yemeni, Yemeni government workers have not been paid their salaries in two and a half years. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and basically they, st they still show up to work. Um, they don't work quite as much because they have to find other ways to earn a living. But if they don't show up, they're afraid, they're afraid they'll lose their jobs and they won't be able to come back when the salaries turn on. And to put that in perspective, about a quarter of all households in Yemen depend on government salaries for an income. Um, so that's a really key income stream. And it's also a key provider of, of social and essential services that isn't getting to people. So summing that up, imports, infrastructure, institutions, and inequality. Mm -hmm. um, that's very helpful. Um, so what's that mean in terms of, we, you know, we know there's been coalition airstrikes. We've heard you talk about the, um, the dependency of imports in terms of food and hunger. So what's that look like then? When we say the greatest humanitarian crisis of our time, what, what are people, I mean, you just were on the ground a few weeks ago. Um, what's the reality look like? What do we need to understand about that in terms of the impact of those four eyes? What it mostly looks like is a devastating economic crisis. Yeah, there are some, some horrific civilian casualty incidents um, and destruction. But when I go to Yemen, I go to a supermarket that is stocked full of goods. Think of the biggest supermarket you've ever seen. It's probably on that scale. And you walk in and you get the whiff of, of cotton candy and popcorn and anything you could possibly want, you can get it. Um, the problem is people don't have jobs and they're experiencing tremendous inflation. And the goods that they can buy in their towns or cities are just way, way, way outside of what they can afford. So it's been four years at a household level that people have seen their, um, their coping capacities eroded. So what I mean by that is like their savings, um, their credit with their neighbors, the people they would turn to for help, they're struggling too. So to make it, to make it really real, um, if you've seen a picture of a malnourished Yemeni child in a newspaper. Um, I, I think it's important to think about the context of that picture. You see the child, you see this child struggling to survive. Well, that child is, if, if pictured, probably in a health clinic. His or her parents probably had to choose, am I gonna spend, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna spend some of the little money that I have taking this child to a clinic hoping that there's treatment available for him or her to survive. And by doing that, I'm going to, I'm going to forego a chance to earn money that day. Um, and I'm probably not going to have enough money to feed my other children. And also think that that child probably has siblings. Um, and so some of the things that family is thinking are, if I have sons, should they go fight in the militias to earn a living? It's one of the only reliable ways to earn money in Yemen. So a lot of families hate the war. In fact, the only thing anyone's ever told me in three and a half years of going to Yemen, when, it, when I say, what's the message you want people to understand, is the war needs to end. Because people understand that it's the war that's at the root of the economic crisis. But that's the only way that you, you're guaranteed to earn a living. So maybe they say, OK, boys, go off and fight. And if they have girls, um, the, the, the choice is, do, at what age do they get married? Um, We've spoken to parents of children. It's important to understand, by the way, early marriage, child marriage is a traditional practice in Yemen, but it was on the decline leading up to the war. And now it is massively increasing. So we've talked to parents who say they want their, their girls, their daughters to grow up, to be educated, um, to become independent, but they see an opportunity to marry their daughters to a wealthy family, and they know that that's her best chance of survival, and it's the best chance of survival anyone else has, and so they do it anyway. And we've seen people, uh, we've seen girls promise to be married as early as three years old, and it is absolutely heartbreaking. Mm. Wow. Um, in a few minutes, we'll open it up for questions to people who've joined us on the chat. Um, before we get there and before we talk about what we can do, how is the U.S. contributing to this conflict and how is the U.S. government complicit? Um, you know, what are, what are the U.S. policies in terms of this conflict that are um, 
in our opinion, at Churches for Middle East Peace, harming yeah. the ongoing, you know, the longevity of this war. So to go back to what, what the Yemenis are telling me every time I go, and these are the people who are the most vulnerable people in Yemen, they're saying, we need the, we need the war to end. And we don't understand why the international community doesn't see that. Um, they equate the war ending to their survival. To break that down a little bit, at this point, Yemen's war has become fragmented. Um, we're unlikely to see peace between all of the different armed groups for a very long time. But, but the conflict between some of those principal parties that are getting international support, the Houthis, the government of Yemen, the Saudi-led coalition, the Emirates, um, there are agreements that they can make that can address some of these drivers of the conflict and, and help save millions of lives. What the U.S. is doing is it's speaking out of both sides of its mouth. On one hand, it's saying, yeah, we want to see a political settlement to the conflict. And on the other hand, it is advising the Saudi led the Saudi and Emirati led coalition on military strategy. Um, it is supporting the coalition diplomatically by trying to shame the Houthis as an Iranian proxy, which um, in, in, strict, in the strictest terms, they're not really. Um, and by selling huge amounts of weapons to the Saudi and Emirati-led coalition members. Um, and I think to most international audiences, the, the, over, the, the overarching message they take away from US policy as a whole is, um, the US sees Yemen principally through the lens of Iran, and even though it's calling for peace, it's not really that serious about it. And it cares more about shielding its, its, co its coalition partners and its friends, the Emirates and Saudi Arabia, than it does about working for, uh, for Yemenis. Um, so that's, that's my sort of overarching sense of like, what's, what's the US role in all of this? Right. Um, we are already getting some questions, so people will email um, cmap at info at cmep.org, or they can uh, chat directly, and so those questions will be coming to us, and so we'll start those in about five minutes. Um, but in terms of, you were just talking about kind of the U.S.'s perspective, um, one of the questions that's been raised, has U.S. policy towards Yemen changed since the Obama administration, or is the policies of the current administration the same? It has changed, but it hasn't changed in a linear way. You know, okay. when the Obama administration um, began U.S. support for the coalition, its rationale was may maybe we can have more influence by trying to quietly engage the Saudis and Emiratis as a critical friend than by criticizing them from outside. And as the conflict went on, they realized it wasn't working. Um, and so towards the end of the Obama administration, they really scaled back their engagement and were prepared to step up their, their criticism um, and create some distance between themselves and the coalition's uh, engagement in Yemen. With the Trump administration, they basically started from scratch. They came in and said, you know, we don't know them, they don't know us, and we're going to proceed as if they are our friends and we can, and we can influence them from the inside. Um, and they've, you know, some people in the administration have gone through the same journey as people in the Obama administration, but what's complicating it all is that there are leaders at the top of the Trump administration who frankly are more preoccupied with the politics of seeming tough on Iran than anything that's happening in Yemen. And it's undermining the work that Congress wants to do and other lower level members of the administ administration wants to do. And that is, that's ultimately the message the world takes away, that what the US wants out of Yemen is to shame Iran. Mm -hmm. So so you mentioned Congress. Talk to us about what legislative actions have been taken thus far and where we are in that regard. Congress has also been on a journey, and happily, it's a more linear journey moving in the right direction. Um, when I started doing this work in 2015, I raised, and Oxfam raised concerns about an arms sale to Saudi Arabia, dealing with the sort of bombs that are being used to destroy a lot of this infrastructure and kill a lot of these Yemeni civilians, and no one really batted an eye. There were some concerns, but no one said, we want to block this. And we've gone from that to a point where um, most Democrats and a few Republicans um, are deeply concerned about the US strategy here. And from, from our point of view, what's important that Congress does is it sent, it, it's important that Congress sends a message that this, um, this unconditional and indefinite support for the Saudi-led coalition regardless of the peace process in Yemen, regardless of the consequences for Yemenis, 
is not what Americans want and is not going to continue forever, right? So um, Congress now at the moment is dealing with two ma major vehicles for expressing that point of view. Um, the most immediate one is, is probably as soon as next week, but certainly very soon, the Senate is going to vote on what they're call what's called the Yemen War Powers Resolution, which would end, formally end US participation in the Saudi and Emirati-led coalition. So we're urging um, activists uh, and people of good faith to call their members of Congress, write their members of Congress, and say, support the Yemen War Powers Resolution. And then after that, there's another piece of legislation called the Yemen and Saudi Arabia Accountability Act, um, which deals with a wide range of issues, but for, for our purposes, the really important thing is it uh, suspends the sale and transfer of certain weapons to Saudi Arabia, and it makes it really clear that that's tied to the peace process in Yemen. Um, so um, it's really powerful for faith leaders to let their members of Congress know, and, and specifically to write their senators and say that this is, this is a moral issue that concerns all of us. Um, and I know that we're gonna be working together to follow up and help organize that. Absolutely. So CMEP is very much in alignment with Oxfam's uh, response to the War Powers Act and the uh, Saudi Arabia Accountability and Yemen Act uh, as well. And so one of our thoughts is that we'll put out an action alert calling on faith leaders and people of faith to um, ask their members of Congress to take appropriate responses to that legislation. Um, so that's something people can keep their eye out for in terms of a, a next step uh, coming out of this conversation. Um, is there anything else, Scott, just before we are getting some questions, and I'd love to um, honor the people who are watching by posing them to you, but is there anything else you want us to know before we kind of move into question and continue the discussion? Yeah, just briefly to note that, that over the past few years, you know, we're talking about the importance of Congress weighing in. We've seen it work. We've seen that as Congress has gone on this journey um, and, and demonstrated that it's concerned about the humanitarian crisis in Yemen and wants to push back against the US role in the conflict, we've actually seen that make a difference in the political negotiations between the parties. Um, and that has a huge amount of potential to help resolve the humanitarian crisis and save lives. So it is, it is so important that everyone has joined us today and I'm really, really grateful um, that CMAP is working with Oxfam together on this. As are we. So thank you. Um, one of the first questions that came in um, mentioned that in addition to, we were talking about starvation and food insecurity facing the Yemenis, um, are they affected by war violence? So what's, what's the actual effects of, you know, we've heard bombing campaigns and things like that, but how are they affected? Um, hugely, uh, and, in, and in a few different ways. Um, in pure, in purely quantitative terms, the number of Yemenis killed and injured by airstrikes, by shelling and landmines um, is just a lot smaller than the number of people struggling with, with, um, with hunger. And also than cholera, we didn't actually mention this, but Yemen has also been the site of the, the largest cholera outbreak ever recorded, which is really shocking. It just speaks to um, the sort of the stone age conditions of basic services like you know, the availability of clean water and sanitation. Um, but in addition, to, in addition to the war violence killing and injuring a fair number of people, it's also responsible for that destruction of civilian infrastructure, excuse me, and it's also responsible for the displacement of millions of Yemenis. There are a lot of people who are leaving their homes because they're afraid of landmines or they're afraid of airstrikes. Um, and that's actually costing them the ability to find work. So they may, they, their, their lives may now be in danger because they are malnourished, but they may be malnourished partly because they've fled an area that's unsafe for them. Um, I believe the statistics that we took in preparation for this conversation came from the United Nations, but I have that there have been, um, since 2015, 17,700 civilians killed. I don't know if those statistics equate with what you have at Oxfam. Um, 70,000 civilian casualties since 2015 and close to 7 million people homeless in terms of displacement. Um, so, I mean, we're not, I know sometimes when we talk about statistics and numbers that are so severe, it's hard to even comprehend what that looks like for a nation, but quite severe. 
Yeah, the best way I can I can put it into terms that people might understand is, um, I, I just imagine myself in a situation where I'm one of that bottom third um, in terms of wealth and power in Yemen. Um, and so not only do I not have enough to eat, not only do I not have no savings and no credit, and I'm probably not gonna be able to find work tomorrow, but every single person I know is in the same boat or worse than me. That's like, that's the thing that really blows my mind. And, you know, living in a country where we just experienced a government shutdown, where people's routines and livelihoods were pretty severely disrupted, um, and people had to rearrange their lives in order to keep, you know, to keep maintaining their plans for their families. Um, to equate, equating that kind of disruption or translating that kind of disruption with the, the severity and the scope of the crisis in Yemen might help to make it a bit more real for people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so I'd invite others who are watching, um, if you'd like to send a question, you can send it to info at cmep.org, or you can put it in the chat function um, on YouTube. Um, we did get another question. Can you expand on the role of the Swedish government in seeking a ceasefire and seeking a resolution? And does this have any traction within the United States? The government of Sweden um, has, been, has played a few different roles, all of which have really been constructive. Um, they hosted the most recent round of peace talks um, and played a really important convening role. That speaks to the, the level to which they're trusted by both sides um, or by a number of different sides of the conflict. Uh, and that also follows a really effective term on the UN Security Council where they spoke out for humanitarian interests. Um, in terms of the US, again, it's a, it's a bit of a sort of a split personality response. Um, there are certain people, for example, Secretary Mattis, former Secretary Mattis, who um, sort of took up the role unofficially of, of um, the U.S.'s chief, as the U.S.'s chief diplomat for the talks, um, and, and dealt a lot with the parties directly, really pushed the parties to make concessions, um, and, and the U.S. Congress and parts of the State Department did the same. Um, but on the flip side, a lot of it was really undermined by public statements by Secretary Pompeo and President Trump, which basically said, we stand with Saudi Arabia against Iran, and that's really what this is about. Hmm. And that's what you were talking about, getting lost in the overarching politics of it's all about Iran, not about you know the, the children and families suffering from cholera or this humanitarian kind of reality in Yemen. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yes. Well, I do have to say we have a close relationship with the Swedish embassy in Washington, D.C., and they are very much in alignment with our policies towards Palestine and Israel and the Middle East in general. Um, so to hear about their significant role in terms of this conflict and the role they're playing is encouraging, but not yeah. surprising. Please do thank them for their amazing work. Yes, well, we'll just go meet with them together. So I think <laughs> it sounds good to me. This conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so another question came in, um, and they said, thank you so much, Scott, for sharing, uh, for sharing with us. Can you explain a bit more about the Houthi movement um, and what it is and how the U.S. perceives it as a proxy of Iran? It's a great question. And I say it's a great question because I think a lot of people who know a lot more than Yemen, about Yemen than I do will uh, probably have arguments over the answer to this. There's not really a shared understanding of what the Houthi movement is about or what the Houthi movement wants. Um, I can answer the second part of the question a bit more easily, which is to say um, they practice a form of Islam um, called Zaydism, which is seen as a, a branch of Shiism, but it's also doctrinally you know, pretty close to Sunnism. Um, and all of that um, combined with some evidence that there have been in the past some links between the Houthis and Iran have created this perception amongst the Saudis and amongst some in the, in the US government that the Houthis are an Iranian proxy. Um, the, the, the exact nature and extent of the support uh, from Iran to the Houthis is, is not really well known and is widely disputed. Um, I think there are two things that are pretty widely agreed upon about it though. Um, Number one, they're not an Iranian proxy. They have their own interests. Um, they have their own agenda. Iran doesn't control them. And ultimately, what they do in Yemen is going to be what's best for the Houthis, not what's best for Iran. And two, whatever level of support Iran is providing the Houthis now, 
and whatever level of support Iran was providing the Houthis before the conflict, the level is the level is greater now than it was before, because essentially um, the conflict has created an opportunity for Iran to provide greater support um, and really draw Saudi Arabia into a conflict that has been costly both financially, financially and in terms of its its global reputation. Um, and so, um, whatever it's not clear whether that's a lot of support or a little support, but it's more than it was before. That seems to be widely acknowledged. Can you talk a little bit more about the U.S.-Saudi relationship? Um, I mean, even one of the things we've been hearing as it relates to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is what role the U.S.-Saudi relationship may play with this peace plan that might be yeah. uh, revealed publicly in the next couple of months. But um, how, how does U.S. aspirations via the Saudi Arabia and that relationship play out in light of what you just shared with the Houthis? It's actually changed a lot over the past four years, though you wouldn't know it from U.S. Yemen policy, um, because four years ago, the context for the beginning of, of this war, or I should say of the Saudis' intervention in this war, was the launching of the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal. And at the time, the Obama administration was very, very concerned that the Saudis would not like that it's entering into this deal, and that they had a 30-year-old uh, crown prince, rise, or de at that point, deputy crown prince, rising to the post of defense minister, and they were looking around and saying, you know, it's, it's really dangerous. This is a guy who might be in power for 50 years. We want him to be a friend to us, not an enemy. And so what can we, what, how can we not antagonize him? How can we show that he's our friend? Um, we can support him. We can offer some nominal level of support in this conflict um, that will be of little cost to us, but will be important to him. Um, like I said before, I think the Obama administration's calculus, both on the conflict and on how they saw Mohammed bin Salman, who is this crown, now crown prince and defense minister, has changed when they learned a bit more about um, the nature of the conflict and a bit more about um, Mohammed bin Salman's ambitions in Saudi Arabia. Um, and. Now that skeptic, the Obama administration's skepticism has been replaced by the Trump administration's enthusiasm, because I think in Mohammed bin Salman they see um, a potential business partner and like-minded ally who is going to stick with them um, in both an economic relationship and a political relationship that is less focused on um, uh, creating stability and more focused on. Um, a sort of a, um, what's economically and politically beneficial for both countries in a more transactional way. Um, I'm not sure, I hope that makes sense to all of our, our viewers. And if, if not, I'm happy to clarify that a little more. Um, that's actually very helpful. Uh, and I think understanding US policies and how it shifted and kind of where we're at today is also very constructive. Um, in just a couple minutes, you know, we'll close. But before we do, you know, one of the things we've been talking about are the humanitarian effects of these political realities. What are some of the interventions and what's the approach of Oxfam in terms of the immediate response to those? Um, and then, of course, I want our last question to be, so what can we do, you know, as we leave and have are, are more informed because of our four eyes. You know, we, we don't want to be remiss in terms of, uh, you know, my one, my first question is like, what, what's Oxfam doing? Um, but then also, what can we do? So the first thing that I, I always try to remind people when I talk about humanitarian crises is that people who live in the, in the communities that are affected are always the first to respond. Um, so we think of humanitarian responders sometimes as, the big international organization sending uh, experts with parachutes who are going to go and make things right. Um, it's important to remember that when a Yemeni is facing hunger or facing an inability to access water, that person's first call isn't going to be to an aid agency. It's going to be to his brother or her cousin or her best friend. And that's, to my mind, and I think for Oxfam, that's what effective humanitarian action looks like. And there's now an entire um, network of Yemeni humanitarian organizations that have sprung up out of the generosity and out of the um, neighborliness of Yemenis seeking to help people in their own networks. Um, and we're doing our best to support and nurture that emergence. Um, in terms of what we're doing and how do we complement that, um, 
Well, what we can do is we can help mobilize um, because international donors aren't, are often pretty reluctant to, um, to give money directly to those Yemeni organizations and organizations on the front line. So we're trying to mobilize international funding and we're trying to bring our technical expertise that we've, we've gained from decades of experience in these emergencies um, to figure out how do we manage the risks of operating in an environment like Yemen and how do we make sure that that assistance is getting to um, people who are the most vulnerable um, in an appropriate way that meets their needs, that helps them live in dignity, um, and that also is transformative, that helps them um, get put themselves in a better position than they were before the conflict, um, including and especially um, in a sense of gender relations. We want, we want Yemen to emerge. We want to help Yemen to emerge. Um, into uh, a place where women and men both feel empowered to work for gender justice. Um, so that's, that's a bit of how we do it. And, and I guess the, the nuts and bolts of it is we build a lot of latrines. We work on a lot of municipal water systems. We support a lot of women's rights organizations and we find and distribute cash to Yemen's poorest people. Mm -hmm. And so for those of us, you know, I know there's um, people on the call from all over the country, Atlanta, Colorado, Washington, DC, of course. Um, but for those of us here in the United States, what then is our role and how can we seek to respond to those local responders, like you said, who are seeking a better future and a different future? Uh, what role can we play? Please, first and foremost, call or write to your member of Congress. Um, you know, I went into the four eyes because it's such a complex emergency, but it, you, you break through a lot of that noise when you talk to Yemenis who are suffering most. And I find it really shocking and disarming that in three and a half years, I have yet to talk to a Yemeni person who is facing the humanitarian crisis who hasn't said, stop the war. Now that we need to be a bit modest and, and humble about how much any of us can do and how much the US government can do. But the fact remains that at the moment, the US government's posture is fueling the crisis. And Congress has played and can play an enormous role in helping to right that wrong. And it's hearing from, from constituents and in particular people of faith who can break through a lot of the geostrategic mumbo jumbo that is gonna bring this around. I'm struck by the word that you chose when you said fueling the conflict, because that is both metaphorical, but also, <laughs> you know, yeah. in terms yeah. of your contributions. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, and the, yeah, until please. recently, um, the U.S. stopped refueling planes in, in October of last year. But to an earlier point that we were discussing, that was largely because of public and congressional pressure. So we can keep that up. Yes, and our commitment is to resource our constituents. And so we'll take a lot of the information based on this conversation and uh, we will be working on an action alert and working on some specific steps that people can take to respond directly um, so that uh, you know that limited progress we made in the fall that we can continue to build on that to seek to make a difference with what we can control and with what our contributions are. Um, so I, I am so grateful for your time, Scott. Thank you for taking a very complex situation and parsing it in a way that um, you know is easy to understand, but also uh, that we have some very clear next steps of what we can seek to do to make the world better uh, and to seek to respond to this crisis in Yemen. Thank you, May, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Good to be with you.